Hello and welcome to the Player Protection Podcast. I'm Jack Simmons and with Matt Saab Cousin, we speak with those working in the safer gambling space, reducing gambling harm. In today's episode, we're joined by Shade Cosgrove, founder and co- uh, co-founder and CEO of Fintelity. Shade, thanks for joining us today. Hi, Jack. Hi, Matt. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be on this podcast today. So, yeah. Oh, great. Well, we've got so much to talk about. Like the, the, the first thing, I think the thing that's on everyone's um, minds at the moment, and I think this is an area that we've sort of touched on before, is around affordability and affordability checks. Um, and I know that you've got lots of opinions because we've talked about affordability um, in the past. But can you give me a, a maybe just tell us a little bit about sort of your perspective on on how affordability can these checks can be made sort of simple? and simplified yeah um so i think it's probably worth mentioning at the moment operators have a duty to do aml checks Mm. and they have to do source of funds checks and the process for that is pretty tedious for pretty much everybody involved and i think that process for those types of checks is what's triggering everybody to worry and think about the worst case scenarios with affordability um and i think like we sort of delve into that current process and the problems with it then it kind of will help provide that understanding on okay with affordability this is what you can do differently for both of these um areas of checks really so at the moment if a player hits a certain threshold for a source of funds check um nine times out of ten they'll get an email from the operator depending on what kind of processes they have in place and that email will request six months of bank statements, pay slips, et cetera. And I guess the biggest issue around that is when they receive that email. So if they're not currently playing, Mm. how long is it sitting there in the inbox? So the clock is ticking from a retention perspective. This is, you know, what the operator is worried about. Um, And then when they do look at it, there's, it's going to be one of two reasons why they decide to not go through with it. And it's either, you know, oh God, I've got to go and log into my online banking and download all of these documents, then upload them into this email. So purely from a can't be bothered. Mm-hmm. Or the the other issue is, you know, you're an operator. Why on earth do you want to I was going to say, I don't want to share document? my bank statements. Exactly. So there's there's that. There's the, the, the data side of it and the process. Okay. Um, so I think that's, because that is the common process with source of funds, I think that's what everyone's like, well, if you add affordability into that, there's more more thresholds for having to do these types of checks and that's the process. So this is more people are gonna be um, a part of that process, which is gonna mm. have a bigger impact on retention. And basically you don't have to do it that way. And I think that's yeah. the bit that people don't have the education on. Like, I wouldn't wanna do that way. You wouldn't, who would? Um, so you can understand why they lose the players at, at that point. Mm. And basically, and, and the solution that, that we have ourselves is we provide the operators exactly what they need without giving them all of those bank statements and pay slips. And I think that's the key there is, you know, what specific data points, red flags are they looking for? What calculations do they need to do? So at the moment, if they receive all of those statements, somebody in compliance or risk has got to go through line by line yeah. looking at every single thing to work out okay is that a red flag you know what's the total income outgoings discretionary etc well, if you only need you know four different data points we can give you those four different data points without you having to see all of that bank statement data and i think that's where you know the hysteria is coming around is that the operators are the ones that see all of that information and work it all out and yeah. actually know we can get rid of that middle bit of them doing the review basically mm. so so just to clear on interest i mean I, I was i did campaign for affordability checks you know and so something that i'm quite passionate about um i think exactly the same as you in in that uh clearly i think a market now has been created for doing these checks in a very efficient way but for that market to be created it needed leadership from government and from the regulator to say this is happening and it might be that you know there's certain elements of the gambling industry that don't want to embrace it or want to resist it um but 
if you're saying that this has to happen and you're setting a direction of travel as the government, the regulator, then they'll find the solution. They'll find the way of making it work for the consumer. And I think you're absolutely right. There just hasn't been, uh, you know, with AML checks, there's just not enough people that get caught up in that for the for there to be, you know, for it to be worth their while to come up with something that's frictionless. But now clearly there is. And uh, and I think it's important to, to recognise as well, I think you touched on it, um, as well, uh, that these checks sort of have to happen anyway. So at the moment, the license conditions require, obviously, the AML checks, but but also the, um, well, basically, can, they, they require the operators to behave in a socially responsible way. And it's obviously very, it's not very prescriptive how the Gambling Commission sort of instructs operators to... Uh, to carry out these checks, but they are expected to carry them out. And in cases where there have been um, you know, social responsibility failings, they've been sanctioned. There's been huge fines that have been given out. And yes, they've used AML as the kind of lead in to that, to that fine, but actually, well, they've used that as the basis for, for that fine, but the social responsibility failures are, are, are very much a part of it. And so they do want to avoid these you know, enforcement actions so I think um, it suits the industry for them to be prescriptive rules, for them to know when they have to do the checks, uh, what kind of checks they have to do, what information they have to gather. And then at least there's, there's a level playing field. So whoever you're gambling with, you know that at that point, it triggers, an, you know, whatever it is, an open banking check or, you know, how, I mean, how quickly do you think something like that can be, carried out like how quickly do you think from the moment that they say right now you've hit the threshold like in terms of time oh in terms of time it can be done in seconds I think it's I think the key things here are the trust element so you know with the current like I say with the current process with the source of funds it's the you know do I trust the operator to have all of this you know all of my bank statements were actually if they're not getting if the operator isn't having those statements and it's literally a case of okay they just need to know what your salary is and they just need to know okay what your average you know discretionary income is over a three month period or whatever it is those two da data points that's all they need and we're the ones actually you know, the, the service provider is is doing the analysis to get those data points and pass it on mm -hmm. as a player i'm guessing that you're going to feel a lot more comfortable with a you know financial services company who's you know and it's not even people, it's technology. So I guess right. that's another element to it is, you know, it's not a human looking at this data. It's 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 a piece of AI, it's a piece of tech that's that's doing it. And I think again that that builds the, the trust. Okay, it's not a human that's looking at my mm. data. It's not an operator looking at my data. And the operator just needs confirmation that, you know, if I said my salary is 50k, it is actually 50k. So I think it's it's about providing trust and reducing how much they currently have to share. And I think that's where, you know, some of the hysteria at the moment on affordability is like, you know, it's really invasive and, you know, everybody's going to run for the hills. We're actually, you're asking them to provide quite a lot now. And the solutions out there is they would be providing a lot less and it's confirmed. So, yeah, exactly. So what does it look like now from a player perspective? So, they're having to provide all that documentation and then you've got somebody in compliance who's going through line by line right looking for the red flags for example maybe payday loans etc yep. um looking at average income average outgoings looking at disposable discretionary and any other flags they've got as part of their their risk appetite and i guess that's the other thing in all of this is the red flags that they're looking for is like you say, it's not prescriptive. So it's it's based on the risk appetite of that operator. And that could differ mm. between operators, presumably, as well. Yeah. 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 Some of them require certain information, bank statements going back a certain amount of time. Others require different things. It really is just an ad hoc. And it's and one of the things we wanted to do is we agree that you know operators should have policies in place that prevent people losing way more than they can afford, particularly in a short space of time, which is, it tends to be how this happens. This tends to be that someone will be a gam will get gambling up and down, up and down, up and down for, for some time. And then they'll have a, a session where the losses just spike because they're chasing. And 
and it just happens very very i mean and that might happen you know several times in the in that person's gam within that person's gambling but you know over a period of time um but usually that's the pattern so if you're if you're if you're setting the threshold we we pushed for about 125 pounds for the initial threshold or actually pushed for 100 pounds but they sort of settled on 125 and if you have the frictionless checks there you're only really talking about 10 percent of the player base and it, it's uh, which is surprising to a lot of people is say well so 90 percent of people are losing less than 125 pounds a month which I guess you know, to to the industry because the industry deals in very big numbers and they're kind of you know they're very often in their little bubble they they think that that's that's nothing that's a very very low threshold. Is but, that collective gambling spend or is that with one operator? So that would be with one operator, but there is the single customer view coming, so that would yes. give us a bit more you know scope to to join it up. But yeah. but it but it just it's just interesting to me that like if if you do the check at a relatively low level even though you know, it's only 10 percent of the player base you're then you've then got the data and the information to set thresholds internally about that person's gambling you're not saying if they're if they're you know losing 125 pounds that you have to cap the spending or anything like that you're just saying let's find out a bit more about this person uh let's see you know how much you know how much we think with, with the metrics that we've put together that it's appropriate for them to be losing, you know, how much disposable income have they got? Mm -hmm. Let's get that information. Um, I would really like to see these checks, the type of checks that you described further up the customer journey. I mm -hmm. personally think, you know, 125 pounds is probably where these checks should take place. Now I understand that they're probably not going to be doing the open banking stuff. They'll probably be doing the, that's probably going to be reserved for when people lose like a thousand pounds a day or something. Um, but I, but I think that like equally as much as I think the open banking checks like what you described should be at 125 pounds I think that the the soft checks which sort of use credit reference data that should just be done at sign up from my perspective it should just be done when you open a gambling account I mean there's no reason why you know something like that which doesn't affect your credit credit score or anything like that but why the operator wouldn't want more information on their customer to build a profile to reduce harm I mean we know they 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 build huge, extensive profiles for, for you know for marketing purposes and targeting purposes. Mm -hmm. So, why they wouldn't want that data up front, I don't really understand. But um, yeah, what's your absolutely. what's your understanding of how it's going to kind of yeah, which checks at what level? What's your understanding of that? So, yeah, a couple of things um, that you mentioned actually that I wanted to touch on within that. So, in terms of like when to do the checks, because at the moment it, it could be done well. The great thing about APIs is you can plug it in at any point in the customer journey. You've got that flexibility and whether you want to do it on onboarding or you want to do it when they're trying to deposit a certain amount, it can happen. That's that's the great thing is no, you know, it's only on onboarding or it's only, you know, when someone's doing X amount of deposits. So I think that's key in all of this is the flexibility of where in the journey. But you talked about like profiles and that's exactly, you know, what we provide is the financial profile on the customer because everybody's different. Um, and, you know, credit checks, they are kind of outdated, I think. Mm -hmm. They don't really represent somebody's financial status in the here and now. Um, and there's lots of different examples I can use, but the one I sort of, there's two. Let's take a student, somebody who's just, you know, graduated from university, they're in their first good paying job, they've got quite a low credit score because they've, you know, got into lots of debt while they're at uni. Um, they've got a low credit score, but then they're trying to apply for a loan or whatever, and it's being held against them. So, but they've actually got a really good salary. That's when an affordability check is is perfect for someone in that scenario. But at the other end of the spectrum, you could have somebody who's just become, you know, a family that's just split up and now a single income household has got a high credit score, but actually the income has reduced and could be offered loans for a car, let's say, for way more than they can actually afford to pay off each month. So I think that credit scores, they do have their purpose, but I think when you're trying to understand somebody in the here and now, they don't necessarily represent that person and, and where they are. Um, and I think in all of this is tying together also things like lenders. So in particular, high risk lenders and um, talking to a high-risk lender called Salad Money, and they're uh, an ethical-based 
lender so they use open banking themselves and one of their red flags again going back to source of funds is they won't give anybody a loan who has you know done x amount of gambling transactions and um i will be sharing some data and i can share it with you guys um after this but one of the examples is somebody that had spent i think it was 1.5 million over 10 10 months and applied for a loan from salad money for a thousand pounds so it, it just it blows your mind so obviously because they're ethical lenders and they're looking at this stuff they turn them down but how many mm. lenders wouldn't turn them down and then that same I guess you'd almost call them a high roller spending that kind of cash then goes to another operator with that thousand pounds they've just got from a high risk lender so all they see is that this person's done you know 1.5 million so obviously they've got a lot of money but actually it's come from a lender they can't <laughs> afford it it's I think the so you so you'd be, able, you'd be able to pick together. that up you'd be able to pick that up then if if that with the checks that you could do with you know the affordability checks for for, gam for gambling operators or whatever you'd be able to see that that money in their account has come from a lender and therefore that should be factored into the to the modeling or or would you just give them that information and they would and they would have to sort of figure that out so no, no we we give them that information so we're we're not the ones making the decisions for them but we're giving them as much information as possible so that they can make an informed decision based on their risk appetite and their business rules but obviously things like you know payday loans or you know loans for, from high-risk lenders we'll definitely be pointing that out so you know if you say somebody's disposable discretionary is is 500 pounds but actually you you're not taking into account that they've just went and got, you know, five loans from five different lenders in the last six months. Mm -hmm. That yeah. isn't really their true discretionary. So I think there's all those things that have to be taken into consideration, but I think the two industries have to work together. So the lenders also have to be looking at, okay, how is this person gambling? Should mm -hmm. we really be giving them a loan? Um, so mm. the checks work in both directions, really, to keep everybody safe. So. Have you have you found that there's been engagement with operators? Have they been quite keen to adopt these sort of more frictionless and um, tech driven solutions to affordability, or has it been an uphill struggle? No, actually, do you know what? I think obviously everybody was waiting for the white paper to come yes. out, and I think that's pretty much changed the the overall kind of feeling towards everything it's like oh we know it's coming so we probably need to do something about it and the ones that we're speaking to they're very much of the proactive mindset of look we know it's got to be done and we want to get ahead of the game and actually mm. implement something and help shape what that looks like as we get more data so I think right but you've also got the ones who are like no nope, not doing anything until the very last minute um, <laughs> <laughs> so you know you've got two ends of the spectrum really yeah well i think the ones the ones that can incorporate it into their customer journey seamlessly will get will, will get an advantage because it, it is coming and you know i don't think there's anything that's going to stop it now um obviously there's still elements of the industry that want to to lobby against it uh you know like holdouts after the second world war but they they probably will not uh they're probably it's a waste of time waste of energy they should be looking at solutions and actually i was at a, a conference recently where reputation matters and it was a lot of gambling industry representatives there who and it and I was surprised at how solutions oriented it was i thought that you know, the, the conversation has definitely moved on from will this happen won't it happen it shouldn't happen to it's going to happen let's find out how to do it um some yeah some very very interesting i think products moving into this space now to try to solve mm -hmm. this problem and and it's and obviously yourself included in that and that's and that's great and uh yeah um what uh what do you think so do you think that what will happen is that the industry will adopt the same solution or do you think that they'll just do it in their own little ways and have their own providers i think the latter and the reason why i say that is because my background is payments so um building e-wallets and virtual proof pay cards for this industry and if you think about payments, there's you know a bazillion different types of payment methods and you've got gateways. And I think this is just one of those really. It's people are gonna find solutions that fit 
the way they want to do things and their journey and they'll and they'll stick with those so I think you'll start to see you know more solutions kind of springing up but I think it is all about you know being frictionless and that retention side but I think the other thing and especially what we're focused on is the source of funds piece because the two kind of go hand in hand and it's a Mm. problem that exists now Mm. that everybody is is struggling with you know the moment they send that email nine times out of ten they lose the player so I think that's another reason why they see actually if you can get that process right with a solution you're half of the way there it's just you know a few extra data points and then you've got what you need for affordability as well so it's kind of Mm. two birds with one stone so so is there a rationale for doing all of this up front at point of sign up I mean, essentially combining KYC with source of funds so that it's done and then the user journey, you know, we're off to a smooth start. Or does, you know, what are there problem would there be problems with that? Um, I think from a, t- a timing perspective, as in I think operators would be worried about dropouts and people not wanting to sign up um, if you have so much stuff going on up front. And certainly the operators that we're working with it's a you know once they hit a certain threshold with a deposit that's when you trigger um i think it makes sense to do everything up front why wouldn't Mm -hmm. you and then you've got your profile and away you go and you just kind of base your checks on as their behavior you get that more information on their behavior you can do relevant checks as, as you need to but i think realistically from a you know they just want that instant sign up deposit go yeah build that relationship yeah they're they're, they they're really really resistant to, to anything that's that, that would mean more rigorous kyc i mean from my perspective like it, it should be quite difficult to open a gambling account like not difficult but like there should be a bit of friction like it shouldn't be just something like you like signing up to a social media account it should be something a bit more than that a bit more like a financial services thing a bit more like a bank you know i mean even even when you open like a a, a trading account you have to do KYC, you have to do, like, you know, send in pictures of your driving license and all that sort of stuff. Now, I know some operators do that already, but I think really to stop people using other people's IDs and all that sort of stuff, which is in their interest anyway, you know, the, I think some of the banks, you have to hold up your ID and say some words into yeah. it. Yeah, it, it, it's all automated. It, take, it takes a few seconds, but they're always very, very resistant to this because they want people to sign up, deposit and bet you know, within a, a few minutes and like that's the kind of thing like they, they, their their attitude is people signing up to bet to put a bet on a particular bet and if you slow that process down they might miss the event you know there's all sorts of reasons why they they want to avoid that but i think fundamentally it's it's the part of the business that's like acquisition and marketing it's that kind of part of the business it's not the compliance part and it's like if you're trying to do compliance stuff in that in that ui ux sort of you know sign up moment that's where there's a bit of like i don't know one part of the business not talking to the other part of the business a lot of the time so i, th- I agree with you jack it, it really is i think it, sh- it should be all done at, at, at sign up but i think that would be better you wouldn't have the break in in the you know, in the in the journey sort of randomly out of the blue the company's then talking to you you know mm-hmm. give us this information it's when you're providing all that other information that's when you provide it um although it would you know at, pre- at the way it's presently operated this even the soft the, the soft checks will only impact 10 percent of people the open banking checks are going to impact about three percent of people um you know any one time so obviously that there's lots of people that fall into that into that uh into those parameters but but uh, yeah I, I i don't think the general general the, the younger generation coming through i don't think they've got any qualms whatsoever with hooking up their open banking so they're going to be protected while that while they're members of that particular online gambling site. I think they've got more qualms with the opposite, with the online gambling site, like, you know, abusing them and, you know, extracting as much as they can from them. I think that's that's where I think there's a, a bit of a generational tension. I don't know if there's something you've noticed in other other areas of, yeah, other sectors. Yeah, I think that in general technology and just where it's going, like you say, the younger generation have grown up with social media and even social media is starting to look into things like doing proper KYC to stop trolls and all that mm. kind of stuff. So it's it's going that way across the board. And then you've got like your buy now, pay laters. You've got, you've got all of these different um, 
propositions out there, but they're all under the microscope and it's all, it's all around KYC and source of funds and affordability. So I think you're going to see it widespread, not just in, in gambling, but in, in lots of different industries. Um, and I think, yeah, the younger generations are so used to that, that it's kind of second nature. Um, and I guess as a customer, you've got a relationship with a business and then all of a sudden, randomly something pops up and you you're required to give more information it it might throw you off it might kind of oh, well, why do you want this and and why now like what's triggered it you know it depends how you know deeply people look into it and 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 think about it but I guess you know it does make sense to do it all up front but I, I get from the operator's perspective they just want to get people on board as quickly as possible but then I guess the flip side is okay so you get all of these people on board really quickly but they disappear very quickly because they quite quickly get to the threshold where you need to do the check and it turns out that they're a fraudster or that they can't afford it or whatever you know and you get a fine how much money have you spent versus actually if you had onboarded somebody and done the proper check up front and actually you know what they can afford you build your profile around that and you have a more sustainable relationship with that person and they might stick around for a lot longer well surely it's better for your revenue taking that into consideration so it's mm. I guess it's you know short term versus long term and like you say that kind of ongoing disagreement between sales and marketing versus compliance but ultimately all of them are going to feed into the finance department and the revenue so yeah you're all working towards the same goal I think they just needs to have more joined up conversations really that's it um, and like it, it, exactly as you say like friction at sign up is actually if once you've onboarded that customer, you're less likely to then lose them, right? Theoretically, if they're, if, if unless that you know, if you've done all the checks at the beginning as well, like they're just going to think, oh, if I've got to go to another op gambling operator, that's a pain. I uh, so I've, I've got to jump through all those hoops to do that. And particularly, there's a single customer view where the other operators, if they've met a threshold or they you know they're flagged as um, likely to be addicted or whatever, then 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 they're not going to take their business anyway. But but e but even from the kind of not, not not just the perspective of player protection, but the, also the, the perspective of like retention. If it's more difficult to do something, you're less likely to open multiple accounts, right? You're just going to be like, I'll just stick with this with this one because it, yeah. I, I think mean, that I think yeah. Our world is friction, so we understand friction in terms of stopping gambling and putting that friction in in place. It was really interesting when these kind when this sort of spate of no account casinos um, were cropping up. There was one I remember where you click a button and it gives you your username and it gives you your password. And it says, make a note of these because this is your username and password. And that was it. And then these other sort of casinos that came about, the the check was essentially the whether or not the deposit went through. So once the deposit went through, I think this was like a trustee or something like that, a pay and play. Um, that was both your sign up and your deposit in one. So in, th in theory, I guess my question here is, could you apply the the source of funds, the KYC, the deposit, and the sign up all in one? Because if we're trading on, if 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 the if what the industry is looking to achieve is um, a simpler process for the customer, in theory, you could kind of trade off those things and end up with a really sleek sign up process, and then it's done. Yes, the the, the short answer is yes, yes, yes. <laughs> That's what I advocate. That's what we built. Um, but I think it's um, in terms of like the KYC piece though. So let's just say you go and do that, all of those checks all in one go. But then if you seed flags, whether it's, uh, you know, this person clearly can't afford what they're trying to deposit or, mm. you know, we think there's fraud, whatever it is that makes you think, okay, we might this might be a potential problem customer. You can make that decision there and then, okay, well, what is, what's the cost to serve versus taking them on and then becoming a problem? Yeah. And I think yeah. that, that's the kind of data that people need to be thinking about and, and looking into is like, actually, you know, how much money are we spending on customer acquisition versus how long do they stay with us versus, you know, how many potential fines have we, have we just missed or, or did we nearly get? Um, and what it costs to do all those checks up front and you know if we actually have a customer who can afford it who's not a fraudster who is going to stay with us for a really long time 
what's the trade-offs? And I, I think those are the kind of things that people need to think about more rather than, a, oh, there's too many checks. We're going to lose those customers. Well, are those the kind of customers that you want it? Mm. I think that's the bit that gets forgotten about. Yeah. Do you want the fraudsters? <laughs> <laughs> yeah simply exactly you know. no. exactly but this is but this is why i think they, have, they haven't done i mean this is where i think the aml failures come from though is that what tends to happen i think if you look at the enforcement actions that you know, the gambling commission in the last few years is that they won't they'll forego the aml checks because they they probably because they think this customer is very valuable to us mm-hmm. if we do the check and we find that there's a problem you know, it's just it's easy to just not not bother not bother doing it. Or if they do these AML checks, which are obviously de facto affordability checks as well, because they then get a load of data about their their affordability. They can then do the affordability assessment, even though it's not prescribed that that's what they're supposed to do. They're supposed to do it. Um, or it's not prescribed how they how they do it, but that they they know they're supposed to do it. So if they've got that information, then yeah, this is where I think I think that unless you have that uniform standard across the sector, unless every operator has to do the same thing, and unless there's proper enforcement of these rules, um, then you will just get exact examples, as you say, where they, they say, "Well, do they want the fraudsters?" Well, I think they just turn a blind eye to them. Some some of them do, and um, that's where you need, like, I think, a strong regulator and one that's willing to revoke licenses because. That hasn't happened, you know, often, I think, in the last, since 2014, when we started licensing. Um, how's your engagement been with the commission? Has it been, has, has there any been any kind of interaction yeah. with them? Are they taking an interest in it? Yeah, it's it's very early days. And I think basically, from, from our perspective, they want to see data on dropouts, because that's what they're getting from the industry is you know if if you implement this we're going to see loads of dropouts so i think it's it's a case it's a slow burner isn't it at the end of the day and what they want to do is they they see the data and then they can make more decisions but i think it's just the scaremongering i guess they, they they're getting it from both sides aren't they they're getting the scaremongering of you know if you do these checks we're going to lose all of these customers we're going to lose revenue it's like well how much are you losing now with your current processes and when you say lose do you mean dot 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 to the black market is that the thing yeah i think it's it's, it's both is it there's supposedly you know if somebody drops out because of you've asked them for six months of bank statements to do a source of funds check have they gone to the black market i'm not yeah. totally convinced that's the case they've probably just gone and gone to a, a different operator but or, or they or they shouldn't you know they should be gambling they yeah. shouldn't be in the regulated market anyway so this is the, this is the other thing like like, so the black market in the UK is very, very small, compar- particularly international by international comparisons, right? You talk about 1%, 2% maximum, one, probably about 1%. And yes, it's, you know, it, it, it's, it is going up, but very, very slowly. And it's going up primarily because the traffic coming from people trying to circumvent GamStop, right? That's basically why, why it's how it's tra- it tracks the GamStop users, right? The, the black market, the, the increase. So a proportion of people that self exclude that aren't no longer in the regulated are no longer in the regulated market will try to gamble in the unregulated market. Now, does that mean that the regulated market should try to get those customers back in the regulated market? Absolutely not, right? That just means that the, the commission should be doing more to block the black market, right? So that's that's where their disruption teams and their enforcement teams are very important. And I know they're putting more kind of resources into that. But the argument that the industry is making that we're losing these customers, well. I think the point you made is very, very important. Do they want these customers? Are, are they implying that all of these customers are um, you know, legitimate? <laughs> that, yeah, that, I don't that, think so. that was a strangely rhetorical question when you asked it, Shadi. I wasn't quite sure whether or not that should be answered. It seems, I think there's a, a level of cynicism here. I mean, you can learn a bit from self-exclusion and the way that sort of um, materialized. I think seeing... I'm talking about land-based casinos, seeing the um, the sort of self-exclusion, the proof um, or at the point of cash out, the idea that sort of, yeah, that was the bit where your your check was made at the point where you've won and you're trying to leave with your money. Um, I, I guess I guess we can learn from history. We can learn from those kind of mistakes and see that um, these things can be kind of, 
gamed in such a way where it's financially better for the for the organization um and you know the 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 onus of you know and, and the kind of the the benefit of doing these kind of checks is there for the operator and not for the individual that that unless yeah, unless exactly. what matt's saying is standardized it's um it's very exactly. difficult yeah and i think the there needs to be more education as well, though, on the black market to these yeah. to these players. So, you know, how many of them actually know that they're on an unregulated site? Do they even know what to look for to know that it's unregulated? And I think, I guess the the main message that I've seen across the industry is that you know, if if we enforce affordability checks, you're going to drive everybody to the black market. But there are problems today with with sign up. And are you suggesting that everybody goes to the black market? I don't think that's true. Obviously, there is a portion, but I don't think that's true. And I don't think people intentionally go to the black market. I think that's the point that I really want to make is how many people have stumbled across an unregulated site, not known that. And it's not until they've got a problem that they realize, actually, I can't get my money back. Or I've got this, you know, they've let me do things I shouldn't have done and that kind of thing. So I think it's, it, it's, it is a problem, obviously, but I just think all of it is about education, upfront education. And, and so if people know what the, and this is the player themselves, they need to know what the red flags are. Okay, this site is dodgy. I shouldn't be here. Um, mm. Where's that education? So I think that's something if, if operators are worried that if they enforce an affordability check that the customer is going to go to the black market, then maybe they should have a whole education piece to go. Yeah. Be exactly. aware of X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. it, it's and totally that... irrational. It's totally irrational to want to gamble in the black market because you don't know if you're going to get paid out. You don't know if the games are operating fairly. You like you, it, there's. It's just there's nowhere to go if there's a problem. You can't report it to a regulator. Obviously, it's unregulated. Um, it's risk on so top of risk on top of risk. The, 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 pro the problem I think is the regulated market is not protecting consumers enough, in my view. That's the reason that people go to the black market. It's because they think it's no different. This is just the same. But I think if I think paradoxically, I think the, the opposite is true to what the industry argues. I think if you improve consumer protections in the regulated market, if you have things like an ombudsman, which acts on behalf of consumers, if you, if you get screwed over and you have like proper regulations and proper enforcement and, and consumer protection and everything looks more legit, then I think... A, people won't fall into addiction, which means that they self-exclude and then circumvent GAMSTOP to find the unregulated sites. And B, I just think there'll be just too much of a difference between regulated and unregulated. I think at the moment, they're just too similar. And mm. that's that's part of the issue. I think people can't even tell the difference a lot of the time. Yeah. Which, and and I, I heard like industry lobbyists make this argument. like People can't even tell the difference. It's like, do you think that's a good thing? <laughs> do you think it's good that they can't tell mm. the difference between a regulated site, an unregulated site, that's, that's not good, right? That 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 means that there's a race to the bottom. And um, anyway, we'll have to see how it happens. But but I think um, I think the fact that you're using the this method with uh, source of funds, AML checks, is great. And that means you've got data to show that clearly that it's improved the process there. So that, that sounds great. Yeah, and I think, you know, ultimately it's about financial well-being. And that's the perspective that I look at it from you know, holistically is money has a huge impact on people's mental health. And, you know, if you're struggling with your finances, it affects your health and vicious circle, especially, you know, those that are working impact productivity, et cetera, et cetera. So I think ultimately what, what operators want is, you know, legitimate players, you know, that aren't fraudsters, that are sustainable and play in a healthy way with good fin financial well-being you know as soon as you start as soon as somebody's finances start you know going the wrong way that's when the problems happen and it can all be prevented it's much easier to prevent it than it is to deal with somebody who's at the other end of the spectrum and you know stuck in the payday lender loop trying mm -hmm. to claw back losses and it's just you know and that for me that's what we're we're on that mission. We're we're looking at it from you know top down. Okay, financial well being ultimately is is underneath all of this stuff, and I think that's the thing that's that's most important. Daddy, thank you very much for joining us. Um, really appreciate much. your time and uh, and look forward to seeing how this progresses.
Thank you. Thanks, Jack. Thanks, Matt. It's been a pleasure.